Hello, Space Junkies, and welcome to What a Piece of Junk, episode number 144. I am your host, Scott Botman, and joining me, as always, is my original podcast co-pilot, Mr. Derek Marsh. Derek, how's it going? Happy Star Wars Day, happy Revenge of the Sith Day, all the fun stuff this weekend. As It was Star Wars weekend, and it was literally on a weekend. Yes, finally, we had May the 4th be with you on a Saturday, so uh, I got to do a whole bunch of Star Wars stuff that day. Yes, it was the first time in a while that I've been wanting to do something, and I've actually been able to do it, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, and exciting. we had big news this past week from Star Wars Animation, which we'll talk about here as our main point of this episode of the podcast, and that is the series finale of Star Wars The Bad Batch happened this past Wednesday. Uh, and so we said goodbye for now to uh, to uh, Hunter, Wrecker, Crosshair, Echo, and Omega, and Batcher, and all those other characters. Uh, and we got, to, I would say, a pretty good finale, good sense of closure for most of the story arcs on that show, Derek. So uh, let's just jump right into it. We can talk some Star Wars Day stuff after the break. Uh, but... Yeah, let's let's hit it. Um, I guess give your overall thoughts about this episode, and then we'll do the five questions. Uh, well, I was just gonna thought that would be overall would be what my my like was. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Hey, no problem. Go for it. Because <laughs> obviously, we'll, we'll kind of question four and five will be a bit unique because we don't get a next episode, quote unquote, to talk about, right? So we'll kind of True. recap the entire series season and all that stuff so um no what i liked about this episode um was i thought it was well one it was what 45 48 minutes so it was basically a two-part episode um that we got which was nice because we were a little worried last week when we recorded like they got a lot to do in a 22 minute episode so it's kind of like yeah eh. <laughs> It was going to be a concern of mine to be like, are we going to have a whole bunch of a, oh, that part didn't really matter kind of res resolution here? Thankfully, yeah. no, because they gave themselves plenty of time. Yeah, but uh, no, this one, um, it was, it was for the most part, a, a fun episode, right? It was actually very, you know, a, a lot of fighting going on, obviously a lot going, kind of going on uh, with the kids, the, the, you know, the Jedi kids in Omega. You had the Bad Batch. Um, you had Echo and uh, Dr. Carr kind of doing their thing. Um, in the meantime, then you had, you know, the side of the Empire, right? Because you had Hemlock doing his side of things along with, uh, you, we got a cameo from uh, uh, Tarkin, um, all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot going on. It um, didn't flow too bad. I mean, it just felt like there was always something going. I didn't find myself like... Like I've done sometimes with a um, Bad Batch episode, like kind of wandering off right and start looking down at your phone. Like I felt it yeah, did like, pretty good, kept keeping my go. yeah, <laughs> keeping my attention. Um, you know, I wasn't scrolling through Facebook or anything like that. So uh, I felt obviously I was I felt like I was invested after three seasons. So at least it was enough to go out in a quote unquote bang. Um, so like I said, I, I did enjoy that from the episode um, overall. So you know, I did I did like that. Yeah, yeah. For me, I think the part I liked best about this episode was the actual final battle out there on the bridge in the rain. You know, it was very picturesque and excellent uh, Star Wars showdown. Uh, and then um, Hunter and Crosshair literally had to lean on each other in order to get the day saved. But, of course, Omega proved that she is... Once again, one of these self-rescuing princesses. Uh, and so she, uh, you know, used her little stick pin thing to, to get Dr. Himlock right where it counted. And he was all, ow, hey! And then the guys just obliterated him. Uh, so it was pretty great um, watching them all work together like that. Uh, and the, I, liked, uh, I liked the part when uh, they were looking at with all the, uh, the rugged uh, rummage. And they're like, was that uh, Echo or Omega? And they're like, Omega. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Definitely Omega. <laughs> yes, that was really good. Uh, and, and I did really like the uh, the flash forward at the end. Um, first of all, called it that we uh, would have yes. a flash forward in the finale because we're kind of getting used to that with uh, Filoni animated uh, helmed shows. 
and uh, getting to see grown up Omega was pretty cool. I kind of want to see her in live action now in some way. Um, maybe even have her do a cameo or a, a background spot on The Mandalorian. I could totally see that, uh, you know, taking place after Return of the Jedi. Um, and then, like, it's one of these things where if you know, you know, as they say. And if you don't know, it's not going to detract too much from your enjoyment of whatever is going on. Um, I don't think we need a, like, full-on live-action Omega... Uh, series, but having her show up at least as part of either part of an ensemble or just you know a cameo uh, would be a lot of fun in live action. Um, and I really would like to know, and it will probably we may get this in a comic book from Marvel. Um, what does she end up doing in the rebellion? Because we leave, we see her leaving uh, Pabu to go help the rebellion there in the Flash Forward. But I mean, obviously that is not post Return of the Jedi. That is at some point when the Rebellion is just sort of getting going and she wants to go out there and actually help them fight the Empire. Yeah, um, I would so. say that was probably, I'm guessing, after <clears throat> the first Death Star, right? When every yeah. kind of that spread of the news would, would make its way out to their little corner of Padu, um, yeah. you know, with what was going on and them trying to stay out. Um, so I, I'm guessing that would have probably been... But it could have been even after... Um, well, I was gonna say you can't really be after Rogue One because that literally is that. <laughs> oh, so right. either way, um, yeah. but yeah, yeah, I would think that would probably be. You're right, not something still pre Rebel Alliance versus the Empire, while the Empire is still in control. Yeah, God help us if we ever get to a point where there are projects that are like this is at the minute one between <laughs> the end of Rogue One and a beginning of a New Hope. Or, but anyway. we did that this with Clone Wars season five. seven. You could line we it up did. with Revenge we of the really Sith. We really did. So, yeah, <laughs> which we all nerded out on, right? Because it's like, oh <laughs> yeah. God. Who am I kidding? That if they if they did that, we'd probably all be like, "This is the coolest thing ever, you guys." <laughs> Anyway, all right. Well, speaking of stuff that is not the coolest thing ever, uh, what did you like least about this episode, Derek? Um, we'll kind of get into it. I'm kind of jumping the gun a little bit uh, here, kind of with um, our question five. But I'll be honest, I didn't mind the jump ahead, but I just I felt like the series just left way too much open and unexplained. Yeah. Um, specifically, we 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 all kind of alluded to. Oh, you know, the cavalry has arrived, right? We were thinking we were going to get some, you know, quote unquote, last minute cameo, but we didn't get any. Um, yeah. It was basically the cavalry was the bad batch. And it was like, yeah. OK, yeah. I, I guess if you actually read it, the cavalry has arrived. That means yeah. that they already had arrived. And that was <clears> the name of the beginning of the episode. So I was like, well, if you think about it that way and you're literally in the English tense, then I guess then we were. That's why, you know, they got us there. Um, so I felt like, I mean, in, in one essence, you could say that Omega ended up being the cavalry for the guys because she had to help them bust out of those chambers that, uh, uh, Hemlock had put them in when he was trying to brainwash them into becoming more clone ex assassins. Um, so yeah, maybe the she's, cavalry, she's the you would have thought well. that would have been something more along the lines of coming in on a spaceship or a rocket horse or yeah. something, right? Not just riding you know, because a tauntaun she, across the jungle. Yeah, she would have been, you know, the big sister arrives or something, right? <laughs> yeah. Although I did see it pointed out online that Wrecker's first line in the Clone Wars is the cavalry has a lot has arrived when Bad Batch is doing something in some battle in the Clone oh, Wars. Oh, see, there you um, go. I, I and I'm like, okay, so this that. must be some kind of a uh, like they're trying to bookend it, you know? Yeah, bookend because that was yeah. It, yeah. Well, I wish you would have said it so again, anyway. just to remind us. But, uh, but yeah, right, I just yeah. I, I didn't <laughs> like that because we didn't get the the Rex and Wolf ending, right? I thought that was going to be something because, you know, we don't know how Rebels got to be. Because in essence, to your point, after the way that it ends, that's <clears throat> most likely after again, who knows? But we think it's after the Battle of Yavon, so you know, Rebels has already happened. That right? You know, Rex and, right, and right. Wolf have already happened. <clears throat> And yet, you know, nobody, it's not like they didn't know at any point where, and I didn't like the, I'll be honest, I didn't care for the way, I'm, I mean, I'm happy that Hunter and Wrecker and um, Crosshairs kind of got their vacation. But again, to me, it doesn't make any sense because they just then forgot all about their brothers. Like they just, I don't see them being able to do that. Like they couldn't just sit there 
and stay <clears throat> quiet because like, well, why didn't they do that this entire time back in season two? Like they escaped. Yeah. Nobody knows where they're at. If they would have just stay put after fee brought them there, nobody would have ever known that they were ever there. Like I, it yeah. made they no were like, sense. we have to still get involved in our fight. And yeah. with the jump, with the jump forward, they do leave space where we could have that story sometime. Like, maybe we'll get... So we've had Tales of the Jedi, and this past weekend, for Star Wars Day, Tales of the Empire was released. Maybe we'll get Tales of the Clones, and we'll get something like that. But, again, this is me sitting here offering Disney or Lucasfilm an out. It just illustrates that they did leave a lot of story structure that they could have done. Correct, and and the the point is then they're retconning because again we're supposed to believe this empire is so bad and devastating. I mean, they basically had that was what part of the reason I love season two so much was that everything that they try to do to offset the empire, it just Palpatine just used it against them, right? Then he's you know yeah, needed yeah. to basically be able to do that. So I don't understand like, and then to me it doesn't you know ring true of then what happens in Obi Wan series where there's the clone begging at the the court. Uh, corner street of whatever planet yeah. i can't remember he's trying to rescue uh little leia from and it's just like i said i i i don't mind that omega survived but i really wish it would have been more gritty to make set make this un, uneasy because we should have known that after this we should have been strapped in for hard times because that was the whole point of why the rebellion is breaking away from it you know, and wanting yeah. to be this, like, like it, it doesn't make sense that this whole entire time that ever all these political people for 25 years, basically since the end and that um, all the way till, till basically return of the Jedi when, you know, the empire is finally dissolved in a sense when, when Palp dies the, how many times, I don't know at that point, it could be his first or it could <laughs> yeah. be his 20th. We don't know. Um, yeah. But it just, it just didn't make me feel like, oh, like the Empire is still out there. It's like we got that like in the flashback. But the way it ended is like kumbaya and we're all good and we're just going to live here. And it's like they wouldn't have been able to do that. I don't care what anyone would have said. Like crosshairs, even with missing his right arm, his shooting finger, still wouldn't have been able to just sit back and because they wouldn't have been able to yeah. do that. And on top of that, I, they didn't age fast enough, in my opinion, because if it would have been because Omega, from my, my understanding, she's a clone but she was supposed to be a regular clone right like boba so she ages yes. regularly but the other clones should have all been now granted we've all made exceptions with rex because they've canonized him for living for how long <laughs> yeah and yeah. and maybe that's part of when they remove the chip right maybe maybe that is part of it yeah right? that's a they good just, that's a good out yeah if they wanted to do something like oh that <clears throat> you know totally throws off their dna and their aging process and it's like oh okay um, but like I said, there was just so much left unanswered, which we knew was going to be the case. But like I said, the way the ending to me was, I really would have wished it would have been a little bit darker to really make it feel like, okay, we now know that the empire, you know, otherwise it just felt like lolly, lolly, la. And that's all. So like I said, I just, overall, you know, I just felt, you know, like to your point, there was just way too much left. You know, it's like, you know, to me, that's not the way the bad batch would have done. They would have gone out guns a blazing. Cause that's what. The, those type of guys literally born and bred for it would have known nothing else or they wouldn't have been like they all would have been like crosshairs then really suffering from ptsd like that right, would have been right. like to me i would have rather had this ended two episodes earlier with them rescuing omega and them just dealing with the side effects of all the stuff that they've had to do in trying to cope with them living in padu right and, you know, would we have gotten them, one of them committing suicide or some, you know, something like that to make it really feel like, OK, this is still bad times when it's the way it ended. Like I said, it's like, oh, it's good times. And we're literally going to skip all these eight, you know, 10 plus years or 15 years, essentially, because we still don't right. know these first three seasons. It's still got to be early enough to that till Luke and Leia are 18 at this point. So, you know, are we preparing for 15 years of still misery, right? I mean, this is what the Empire is supposed to be. As I'm, I was, you know, rewatching Solo before we kicked up here, right? Like, that's true 
you know, where the Empire's at, all these planets are devastated. People are either working in crime lords or they're they're being picked on by the Empire or they're slaves, right? And it's just like all these people are living under that. We, you know, you'll see it when you watch Tales of the Empire. You see that in the first three episodes of um, Morgan Elsbeth's story, right? Like it's really good and it's telling me how crappy the world is. And that's what I like because it's like, yeah, that makes me hate the Empire more. That makes me understand the people like with we got going on with the real world issues right now with Israel and Hamas and, you know, Palestine and all this stuff like it literally should. And again, it's a cartoon, but Rebel showed us that it can be, you know, serious. Clone Wars showed us it can be serious. Um, And I don't know. Like I said, so I've gone on my soapbox way too long for this, but that was it. (laughs) I would just felt that, like I said, just the way it was going. I really liked it. But to be honest, I didn't like the flash forward because it in the ending on that sense, because it was just too happy for me. Yeah. Uh, I forgot that uh, Nathan actually sent us his answers to the questions ahead of time. Oh, yeah. Because he knew he wasn't going to be on this show. So his favorite thing was everything that happened with Echo. Uh, his least favorite thing is that the Zillow Beast shows up and then buggers off. And that's it. <laughs> that was very disappointing, he says, uh, showing for something that could have been a big factor, but it wasn't. So Zillow Beast not appearing in this episode. Well, no appearing Mecca in this episode for, nothing, for like nothing. three three minutes, you know. Yes, I, I was so hoping for my Godzilla, Mecha Godzilla moment, but you, you can't win them that all. Whole, that uh, whole episode that we had prior was only so that way the Bad Batch could break into Mount Tantus. That was the only thing. They made a whole episode yep. just so they could have an escape episode where the monster breaks a giant hole in them for. Yeah, yeah. Now, if years from now there is another show involving the whole Mount Tantus situation. And the Zillow Beast comes back because it's been living out in the jungle and it just shows up at the cru- crucial moment. Then maybe that was worth the buildup. But as it is, I kind of felt like, what? That was yeah. it? The Zillow Beast breaks out and leaves? Anyway. So, yeah, uh, for me, the least favorite thing for me of this episode was, I essentially agree with you there about the ending. Uh, I, I wanted more uh, meat on the bone when it came to, well, what's going to happen with the rest of these clones? And there are even more clones that they rescued and sent off to be with Rex and them in this episode, when they, when Omega and Echo break into the prison uh, level of Mount Tantus, and there's all these clones there, and they free them, and they help them have that huge fight against uh, essentially the anti-Bad Batch, or the oppo- Mirror Universe Bad Batch. Uh, the the cl- extra clones that uh, were all fancy mustaches. pants and you know specialized <laughs> yes twirled mustache uh, bad batch with goatees with um, mirror and uh, <clears throat> yeah mirror universe bad batch uh, so you know those dudes <clears throat> help Omega and Echo fight that crew uh, so there's a whole other group of clones that have been rescued now and we have no resolution about what they're going to do. Um, so yeah, that was my least favorite thing, uh, as well. All right. Question number three, connections. Uh, Nathan says the landing platform felt a lot like a Kaminoan one, which feels thematically appropriate for clones. And of course, and it was raining. his big, it was raining too. Yes. And of course his big connection, uh, was with Tarkin and Project Stardust. When Echo said clones never leave clones behind, Mr. Miracle writes, I had a big laugh because he got left behind at the Citadel himself. So Echo was one of the clones that got left behind by other clones. And then, of course, we find him again in the Bad Batch and we're like, wait, Echo's alive? He's been dead canonically for years. And in real time, as we discussed when he showed back up, in real time, Echo got killed, I don't know, like 12, 15 years ahead or maybe not that long, but a while back. Um... So, yeah, uh, Derek, what connections did you draw to the rest of the Star Wars galaxy? I mean, mine mine was the Stardust one for the most part. Yeah. Um, you know, that was the pretty obvious one. Uh, obviously, like I said, uh, at the end there with Omega going to basically join the Rebel Alliance, um, you know, so there's kind of, you know, we've seen that, like, with a lot of these um, one-off movies, like Solo, for example, that I was just mentioning, right? There's this whole, you know, I'm going to help the Freedom Fighters, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, it makes sense for Omega to do it, um, but uh, you know, I, I you know, uh, overall, I'm trying to think of any other major connections. Uh, no, a I major mean, connection were... for me was um, we were talking about the Mirror Universe Bad Batch, the the Bad Batch Goatee Squad. 
um, all the all the action with vibro knives. And so, of mm. course, every time I see vibro knives now, uh, I used to think of Star Wars video games because you can use a lot of vibro weaponry in Star Wars: The Old Republic MMO. But nowadays, in a post Mandalorian world. I mm-hmm. think of Paz Vizsla and Mando and all the other Mandalorians that we saw on that show do a vibro knife fighting. Uh, and then now I also think that uh, the Acolyte trailer that we saw before or after The Phantom Menace, uh, I can't tell if the girl who is fighting Master Indara is using vibro knives or she just has old school knives. Um, I think but they're like c- like almost like little throwing stars because... Yeah, well, we like could talk about it. Our, some yeah, because yeah, she throws yeah, a we'll bunch get to of them. That, we'll get yeah. to that after the um, after the break. But uh, anyway, yeah. vibro knives were my thing because you you had multiple vibro knives and staff weapons and whatnot and swords uh, from the mirror universe bad batch there uh, with the yellow glowy effect because it's you know this is a cartoon and it's harder to show things vibrating like they do in the live action. Um, now, of course, I'm assuming that this is that the yellow glowy is a modification of vibro weaponry. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, and those are actually not vibro knives, and it's some other form of, of not quite a lightsaber. Um, but I'm going to go with vibro weapons for for now, because I think that's what they're supposed to be. Um, and, uh, yeah, I liked seeing that, and liked seeing uh, people who aren't Mandalorians using vibro weaponry in the Galactic Civil War era here. I'm trying to think if there were any other connections that really jumped out at me oh (laughs) the entirety of the idea of the mirror universe bad batch reminded me of this is not this isn't really a connection it's a connection but not a not a follow-up it's a prequel connection uh in that they made me think of the knights of rin from the sequel trilogy because each one of them was black armored clearly a bad guy and had some sort of signature weapon Uh, It's like this idea of a team of bad guys to oppose the teenage mutant ninja. I mean, um, the power rich. I mean, I mean, the the bad batch. Um, Yeah. So it's that whole concept of a squad of evil warriors, each with a signature weapon. Um, It's also kind of like in a lot of samurai films, because, you know, Star Wars Mm. always will owe a huge debt to Kurosawa. And so you could have seen this kind of thing be in a Kurosawa film. Uh, Even one of the Mirror Universe Bad Batch looked like he was wielding two vibro katanas. You know, mm-hmm. I was going to say there was one thing that um, did did relate. First of all, um, we 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 totally forgot. I mean, I mentioned before, Crosshairs loses his right arm, so we got yes. that connection. <laughs> but also, too, when they're fighting the Shadow Clone Assassin <clears throat> guys, um, for whatever reason, that room that they were in, um, that Hemlock was in initially, and then they pushed him out. Um, to where the guys were on the ground, it was almost looked like um, the way that the ground, like certain parts were raising up. It almost looked like mm-hmm. earlier, like we had in Clone Wars, when we see the bad, um, not the bad batch, but the clones training, right? They're doing their training and they have the different simulation rooms. Oh, yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. Because so, uh, we actually we actually did see the bad batch do the simulation room. Yes. Yeah. Uh, earlier on we in the saw series. That season um, one, but then we've seen that <clears throat> yeah. with clones too. We saw that in Clone Wars. Um, is also yeah. a, a uh, uh, you know, one episode, of, I can't remember, I think it was with Fives or something like that um, when they were doing that. So, so that, but to relate back to your mirror, to your mirror verse, then what it reminded me <laughs> is, is in first contact with the green smog. And it looks like, you know, when data and the Borg and all that and John Luke, and that's what yes. I, I looked at with yes. the cable cords and everything. I was like, in, Oh, this looks the, like first contact. <laughs> yeah. In the, in the, um, the warp core, the engineering yeah, room of the yeah. enterprise E. Yeah. yeah. And the, yeah, yeah. Oh man. If they had beaten the, uh, the mirror universe clones by, by, uh, smashing something and having like the goop come out or lava, you know, cause this is star Wars. So we have random lava everywhere. Uh, if they had done that with the lava or whatever, I would have been like, yes, that is absolutely a star Trek callback from first contact. Yeah. <laughs> ah, good times. Um, I'm trying to think if there was one more connection to draw there. Oh, I do remember what I was thinking about the mirror universe bad batch. Um, the, that was apparently what was in those tanks that we saw behind the laser gates uh, that you were mentioning a couple episode, a couple podcasts ago. When we, because we we, had, we were like, we're finally going to get to see what is behind the laser gates, and it seemed like all that's back there. You just walk through that long tunnel to the room where they keep all the force sensitive kids. 
And you were like, yeah, but what about those big black containers with like the red glowy stuff that we saw even early? Well, that's the thing. Those are the things that the evil Bad Batch came out of. So I guess those containers were making clones of Wrecker and Hunter in them. Maybe. Or something. Something. Yeah. But we won't anyway, know the, at yeah. this point. So. Right, right. All right, question numero quattro. Oh, and, well, and then I was going to have one more connection. Oh. Sorry, because then um, when Nala say and Rampart die, it blows up the um, uh, data center, right, and all that stuff. So yeah. um, definitely, like, the center of the building type deal, like, where everything blows up, yeah. right? So Death Star type deal. Didn't have a chain reaction quite like everything else, but uh, definitely was like, oh, they blew up the vault, so... And more importantly, we got a line from uh, Commander Scorch, I think, um, explaining, hey, they blew up the, the data center. All the, all the information is gone. Because, kids, there's no such thing as the Internet in Star Wars. Star Wars is analog. Star Trek is digital. Uh, and and so nobody makes a have, copy. <laughs> we don't have off-site backups. That's why you had to go to Scarif to get the Death Star plans in Rogue One. You couldn't just hack some system and download the Death Star plans. I, w I would love at some point in the future if there's an episode of some kind of Star Wars uh, property where somebody explains the reason that we don't have even like hardly ever even planet-wide networks much less system-wide or galaxy -wide it's all radio frequencies networks. and everything else something about it takes too long to transmit or in the star wars galaxy there's some kind of background radiation that just mucks with anything that's faster than local radio you know, like, oh, oh, but it would be cool if this was some sort of weird midi chlorians generate a magnetic field that messes up fiber optics. So we're Darn never that M count. Move past. Darn that M count. We're, that's right. <laughs> we got the, we tried having physics and the force in the same galaxy and it just didn't work. So we got rid of one and kept the other. And but it's that's like, why we're, spaceships we're never can do all this random stuff while yeah, sitting still. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. it's a give or take. <laughs> it's also why. It's also why spaceships can casually fly down into the atmosphere of a planet, and you hardly ever see anybody worry about re-entry or yeah. losing control or, or you know, hey, the Millennium Falcon's not really aerodynamic, but it sure can fly through the air pretty well. To say nothing of Slave 1, which is basically a brick with a thruster on the back of it, and and it can, like, hover over the um, dead gum Sarlacc And it lands, pit. like, on its back, and then it takes off, and then it... Yeah, yeah. But nothing's like, keeping it from just going like this the whole time and just yeah. go face forward. <laughs> yep, midichlorians. Not they generate the force and they mess with physics. That's what's that's the answer here. So, yeah, the data center you know, gets destroyed. Tyson. There you go. You can take that from us. Make <laughs> it on Star Talk. The, the data center gets destroyed. All of the information about Project Necromancer is apparently lost, which begs the question of. Well, now we did sort of predict this when we were like, I bet that um, Dr. Carr is going to mess with the thing so that the reason that uh, Gideon, Moff Gideon in The Mandalorian seems to be almost starting over when it comes to making clones. It's like he's all excited about pulling off eight copies of himself. And I'm like, dude, the Kaminoans were doing this with Jango Fett generations ago. Well, it, all the information just got blown up, so nobody knows how to do it. They have to almost start over from scratch. But again, nobody know? makes so. a backup data disk. So that's yes, what they always tell you. Make backups. sure you should have saved and then take it with yeah. you. So, oh, well. Yep, yep. Well, you know, Palpatine is such a control freak. He probably outlawed backups. Uh, when it comes to the Empire, because he didn't want anybody, the chance of anybody other than But him isn't a clone a just a backup? <laughs> Whoa. He's, he's fine with backing up people, just not data. Oh, yeah. he's anti-AI. Anti I, I appreciate the man. He's anti-AI. He, yes. he doesn't trust computers. That's why droids are doesn't outlawed. Doesn't trust computers. They're, nobody likes yeah. droids. So yep. They don't droids like data. They're like... Because yeah, we have to deal with it because it's dirty data, but we have to deal with it because it helps. Otherwise, screw data. We just want real people. Otherwise, they'd be sitting well, there like scribes and writing everything, right? So, well, if you think about it, they kind of do have scribes because, but, but they and they have to keep reusing all the disks. Remember in um, um, Andor when uh, oh, what was the creepy security chief guy's name that got demoted because the man because Mando oh, and, uh, um, Andor and. Uh, what was his name? Cyril. Cyril. 
Cyril, yes. When Cyril uh, had to go and get that new job at the uh, at the like data processing Account. center. Yeah. Yeah, and he's like it's sitting in that cube or that hexagon uh, yeah. to uh, keep processing hard drive after hard drive, basically, and because because they have to reuse them because you can't like like okay this was somebody's grocery list, but that person is long dead and we desperately need to take the plans for this X wing out to the system so they can start building their own X wings, and we don't do email because we're analog. It doesn't so exist. Please re- record it onto this magnetic tape. <laughs> Which I will then get into a starship and take it to the far reaches of the galaxy to help the uh, the rebellion or the New Republic. Uh, actually, I would love to see a Pony Express show uh, for Star Star Wars now. Like like the whole show is dudes. Well, I mean, we got a little bit with Solo, right? They were doing that with with the mm-hmm. um, the train, right? When they're robbing the train, essentially. Yeah. And then, yep. so all we need to do is get um, uh, um, uh, not Michael Keaton. Um, who played the postman? Who played the postman? Oh, Kevin Kevin Costner. Kevin, Kevin Costner, yes, thank you. Kevin Costner. Uh, we need to play him. He can just, you know, postman Star Wars. Yeah. So, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Post apocalyptic galactic postman. Yeah. All right, cool. Okay, all right, all right. Question four. This is a very broad ranging question. So, Derek, I uh, hope you got something in the chamber here. What were your final thoughts on the entire Bad Batch series? So on the entire series, so we really, really liked the small four episode arc um, in season seven of Clone Wars when we first got them introduced. Right. Right at the beginning, those first four episodes, we thoroughly enjoyed it. We were excited when they announced that they were going to get their own spinoff. It's like up oh, typical Filoni. Right. He introduces some characters and then he wants to continue, you know, in animation. So there we go. So we watched season one. I liked it a lot because, again, it it, it just felt good, um, you know, getting everything with, with these, you know, we, we got to see what it was like right after the Empire, right, literally right after Revenge of the Sith, essentially, right? Um, and we got to see because, again, it was an eight, you know, 18-year gap, essentially, between that um, and, and then uh, A New Hope. We got a little bit with Solo. We got a little bit with Rogue One. Um, and we obviously, you know, had this opportunity here, uh, that we were able to get it. So I really enjoyed this, you know, ragtag bunch of guys. Um, we got to have, you know, fun, fun episodes with them going on these mercenary missions. We got cameos from characters in, in Clone Wars. Um, you know, again, we had some really great, um, cast, um, video, uh, voice acting, um, you know, with obviously Rio Perlman. I loved to Sid. Um, and then, you know, we had some drama and stuff and I really thought we were getting some good character development. And then all of a sudden we get season two and it's like, okay, some of this seems like it's really just the MacGuffin. It's really kind of dragging out, but some episodes are really good. And then towards the end, we get this whole, you know, the, the Senate, right. And fighting for clones, um, you know, justice for clones. We get the whole, you know, how, Papeltine turned it around and basically said, we don't need clones anymore, but we need military force. So, you know, we need to actually start, you know, using the empire as a recruiting agent and build our own military. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, you know, we got some really good gems in there. Um, you know, we got uh, reintroduced to Senator Chuchi, Uh, and then, you know, we got the whole Mount Tantis right at the end there, the last yeah, couple yeah, episodes. Yeah. And we were like, okay, this is really getting good, right? Because we've had some stuff with Mandalorian season two with cloning. Um, we obviously had that with the rise of Skywalker and we're like, okay, now we're actually going to get some connect connections here. We're actually probably going to get some true heir to the empire stuff. And then, you know, we start, you know, getting Ahsoka and all this stuff. And then we get this season. And as we've, you know, kind of dictated along the way, at least I've mentioned it, right. Where it's like, Okay, we start out at Mount Tantis, we get away, then we go back to Mount Tantis, then we get away, and then what's to say it's not going to keep repeating itself? Well, this time we're not going to do it because Mount Tantis is destroyed. And it's like, yeah, but you still got all your clones out there. So, um, and I didn't even mention this in my question too, too. Uh, The thing was, is then all the great side characters we were introduced, we didn't get any conclusion with them. We didn't find out what happened to Sid. We didn't have happened to find out with V. You know, we just assumed she lived on the planet, was still doing mercenary stuff. And it's like all this time, you know, anyways, not to go down that rabbit hole. So uh, back to that one. But the, uh, you know, overall, 
I was I was happy with the way the series was initially going. And then, like I said, I felt like season two just, you know, and I thought they were going to do a better job with season three because they knew it was the finale. Like, I thought yeah, that saying, yeah. OK, we they're you know, they're going to grant Filoni one more season, not just leave it up in the air for 10 years <laughs> like they did almost right. with Clone Wars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we're going to be like, oh, we'll just patch some unused edited footage and try to salvage something right that gets picked up by Netflix um, until Disney decides to give Filoni something, you know, an actual. Um, but I'll be honest, really, season two and season three for me could have been a four to six episode arc or a movie and it would have been just probably more well written it would have been a lot more better and i wouldn't have felt like i wasted 50 plus percent of the time just watching these episodes where you get two seconds of character development and the rest of it's just oh i guess it's a big hairy monster again we gotta fight this episode this week you know it was almost like a star it always trek. a big giant monster yeah it's like it was a star trek trope you know like what's your well, alien yeah. race you're gonna meet this week you know who's the big yep. baddie yep. you know and it was the, just like the alien okay. of the week so yeah alien of the week so anyways um and, and the, the bad thing too is i don't know again if it was me or we've talked about this but i really felt like the animation from season to season just kept getting worse and worse. Like season one, we talked a little bit about it, but it still felt pretty clean for the most part. I don't think we picked on it as much season two and season three. There was just a lot of dark episodes. Um, yes. I'll be honest. The, the last little, this last episode here, especially with the, the last couple minutes when we do the time warp um, or time jump, that, yeah. that animation just looked poor for Omega and Hunter. Like it didn't look finished. Again, they're in the dark, yeah. right? He's got a bonfire in front of him, you know, taking off. But the animation just looked cruddy. And I know that yeah. they just laid off all these people, you know, the original people who made the original Clone Wars movie um, over, was it Philippines or China? I can't remember. It was late was last year, early this year? Like that. Yeah. yeah. Somewhere some over, in Southeast Asia. Yeah. So, but it, it, to me, it was just like, really? I mean, you, you cut the budget or you try to save a bunch of money by laying people off, but you didn't improve the animation. So... So overall, that kind of where it's just I tell people it's like, yeah, I, I would say you get pretty much the bad batch. And there would probably be like a few key episodes um, where I could tell people like I'm sure at some point somebody will go through and say like out of what would they would have had like 45 to 50 episodes between the three seasons. Here's like the 10 or 12 episodes that you really have to watch. Right. And yeah. be like here tells a clean story about the bad batch, you know. The episodes that were about the Empire, we loved. I thought those were great, right? You got to see behind the scenes. Anytime those, like, those were great episodes, which sucks. Like, we talked about, like, the, the best episodes were when the Bad Batch weren't in them, you know? Yes, it's just that's like... right. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> other other than the, the few fun episodes that we did get, um, you know, but other than that, you know... You, you could even skip the whole one episode about the Zillow beast. I mean, like it didn't really serve a purpose. Like we said, because at the end, all it did was just create a giant hole. Like you could just see, Oh, it's just a giant creature that the, you know, they kept in the depths of Mount Tantus and they were going to do something with it, but we're not going to tell you, or we're going to mention anything why we have it. Um, so like I said, um, so overall, like I said, I'm a little disappointed just because clone wars, especially clone Wars season seven. But again, that was under Disney. Um, and then Rebels has been phenomenal. And um, Visions has been phenomenal. And this, I just felt, even though we knew we were getting a final season, I just, like I said, just too much was left open. I think it was just too over the place. And again, we talked about it a couple episodes ago um, with Filoni kind of, I guess, not truly overseeing it, I don't feel like. Um, kind of right. giving the people um, free reign for the writers, which I appreciate. But did you train them right? Just like Lucas trained you, Filoni. <laughs> you got to train them. So, anyways, yeah, I'll give you I'll give you some first, time to talk, Scott. First, first apprentice isn't all that easy. Um, yeah, uh, I agree with you very much about how there were some really bright spots in the Bad Batch overall, but uh, for the most part, I don't feel like it's super required um, Star Wars animation viewing. Uh, I think that the um, the major way that I could draw a parallel here is that this is the Star Trek Enterprise of Star Wars animation. 
where the the good episodes are really really good, but the average episode is kind of eh, to, and so you know I I say that uh, I really enjoyed the character arcs for each of the Bad Batch members except for Wrecker. Wrecker I feel like is exactly the same as he was during the Clone Wars television show and during season one of Bad Batch. Wrecker is exactly the same as he is what when we get to the end. But that's why we like Wrecker. <laughs> yeah, he's 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 our he's our he's our rock. He's our foundational guy. And as such, we really don't want him to change much because then he's no longer a foundation. He's he's unsteady, right? Um, but you know, everybody other than him had an arc. Even Echo, who wasn't really part of the Bad Batch to begin with. Um, but yeah, Tech's arc, of course, was that he led up to finally understanding emotion because you know he used to be all Mister Ro- Mister Roboto. Uh, and then he now finally understands emotion, and he sacrifices himself. Yeah, that for his pod racing team. episode was pretty fun. I remember that one. That was that cool. was pretty cool. And that was um, season two. Then, that course, was season two. Yeah, yep. Of course, Crosshair's arc is that he, you know, became a villain and then had his redemption. Um, Hunter's arc was realizing that it's okay to let other people be in charge every once in a while, uh, and then and becoming um, a father. Echo, and becoming a father. Yes, essentially, he moved beyond. Uh, squad leader and beyond big brother to actual father. Uh, so much so that in the flash forward, we see him really doing the hard part of being a dad, which is watching your adult children go and make their own decisions, even if part of you feels like these are really terrible decisions and you wish they'd make better ones. I'm not talking about you necessarily, Joseph, but if you hear this episode, make better decisions, son. Um, and so uh, we get to see them all change, right? All change and grow. Uh, and and whatnot, so, which is always a good sign for a, an ensemble show, whatever that may be. If it's a crew of Starfleet officers, if it's a group of heroes, uh, if it's a collection of cops at one particular department, if it's doctors who all work in one emergency room, whatever the case may be, if you have an ensemble show, you want each character to have a chance to shine and each performer to have a chance to go through actual gambit of emotions. Uh, that's Gambit, not Gambit. Uh, and so you you get to see them change and grow, um, which is good writing, in my opinion, for an ensemble kind of show. And The Bad Batch is a quintessential classic, I don't want to use the word trope, but almost trope, of the conglomeration of the four humors when it's expressed as each character. Like we've discussed many times on the podcast, Star Wars dips into mythology and mythological structure like this really well. Uh, and we all, as kids of the 1990s and, and newer kids today, can still see this in lots of different production of heroic stories or journeys. There's four members of the team, each of which is associated with a particular type of emotion that is usually used in, in mythology, uh, the four humors. Uh, I won't bore everybody with the repeating it. There are episodes we've done that we've talked about before. And of course, you could look online about how the Ninja Turtles are the Power Rangers and the Power Rangers are the Avengers and so on. They're and all so Voltron. Um, they're all Voltron, yes. Together with, you know, heart, earth, wind, fire, we form Captain, Captain Planet. Planet. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, that reference is way too dated. Anyway, um, but the point is, they did a good job with that concept of the show. Now, was it executed well on every episode? No. Um, and I would say that this, again, this puts it almost in the middle point of Star Wars animation. Um, if you watch it, I think it'll be worth your while and you'll have fun. Is it required viewing? Is it just is it is it to the level of Star Wars Rebels, where it changed the franchise forever for the good? I don't know about that yet, and I'm willing to say no. It didn't really change the franchise, good or bad. It wasn't that it ruined the franchise or anything crazy like no, there's that. There's a lot of great points like, that we talked about. The Empire stuff, yeah, especially, filled in a lot of great holes. Yeah, but but could we have survived without filling in those holes? Probably. Um, so I don't no, know that it made I would more say holes. That it, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> At a certain point, it's spackle on spackle. Anyway, um, so I enjoyed it. I'm glad we watched it. I'm not exactly going to go back and watch it again, yeah. like I have with some episodes of Star Wars Rebels. Yeah, um, Clone now, Wars if season something... seven. Bam! Oh, yeah. instantly we'll watch that in a minute. Your point, Rebels. Oh yeah. So now. If something amazing on Ahsoka happens where, like, Omega shows up, it might make me go back and watch some episodes of The Bad Batch in the future, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I think if I'm, you were to take all the good episodes from Season 2 and Season 3 and put them together for one season, I think we would have a different story plot to this, right? Yeah, yeah. 
All right, question number five. And this is actually Nathan's question that he submitted ahead of time. We seemed to be building up to a clone rebellion, but the prisoner escape at Mount Tantus seemed to be a different thing. Also, we had a very obvious omission of the details of Project Necromancer. Like, what actually were they trying to do? We're assuming this was the let's make a new body for Palpatine, but maybe not. Um, and then, so Nathan's question is, do we think that there's a project that is an animation project or a comic book or a video game or a movie in the works to explain those things? So I'll answer this one first. Um, I think there is a project in the works to handle the clone rebellion. I think that that will be another Star Wars animation project because I feel like Dave Filoni and friends really want to do, even if it's just a movie, they really want to do a clones, troopers, fight, stormtroopers kind of battle, war, something or other. Um, and that'll be that when it comes to the clone rebellion. Uh, as far as the details of Project Necromancer, I think all of that is still going to be handled by the Mandalorian, either in a season five, which I do think is still going to happen for Mando, and or in the Mandalorian and Grogu, the movie, um, which, God, I still am very hopeful that we get a different title <laughs> than Star Wars, the Mandalorian and Grogu, brought to you by <laughs> Frosted Flakes. Hey, right, it's just in the first, like, five, like ten minutes to get everybody caught up, because maybe nobody's watched the entire series or knows about this, other than the merchandise of baby Grogu, we get the Clone yeah. Wars voiceover. That, that tells you, like, oh, yeah, a, 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 <laughs> yeah not, a, not a crawl, but but actually, you know, um, um, uh, Tom King, or well, yeah. sadly, it had to be somebody yeah. impersonating Tom King, uh, a Tom King style newscaster, you know, yeah, but Emperor Palpatine has been defeated and the Empire has crumbled, but in the galaxy's outer rim, brave bounty hunters like the Mandalorian and Grogu, <laughs> yeah, you know, they give me the yeah. whole deal there, and right? Ahsoka has uh, returned just, from nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's right, yeah. <laughs> Former Jedi Knight Ahsoka Tano, hero of the Clone Wars, has been missing since galactic year blah blah blah. Well we anyway. get like a five minute intro, kinda of like what they did with Lord of the Rings, right? Where you get this whole uh -huh. like ten minute epo. Let's give me that. Give me that as a uh, to get everybody caught up. I've been great with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Anyway, Derek, what are your thoughts about question five here? Do we think there's a project in the works to explain Clone Rebellion, Project Necromancer, yada yada yada? Uh, well, to go back to, let's go to the first question. So the Clone War type deal, I don't know, right? Because the way, again, this, and this is why I dislike the way this ended, because to me, it feels like, again, the Bad Batch, you know, they all are happy. They're all still alive, but yet they wouldn't have left their brothers behind. They still would have gone out and put Omega at risk and cause Omega would have been like, I have to save my brothers too, you know? Um, and so I, I don't like, you know, it, to me, it just felt incomplete. And again, we have to figure out what happens with Rex and Wolf. So again, if we get a one shot, all right, so be it. But how does Rex and Wolf end up on whatever planet then that, uh, the rebels and, you know, find them, uh, yeah. or Phoenix squadron well, finds I, them I, to get, yeah, how do they get to the, the, the fishing planet as I like to call yeah. it? Cause they're out there fishing in the desert. Yes. Um, for the fact is, too, because it's like Rex has to be basically defeated at some point, right? Because otherwise he would have kept fighting. Like, he has to be defeated at some point to for him to basically go to retire, right? Um, or to feel enough where he can't contribute to the war anymore, right? Because he would continue to fight till the day he dies. So something has to happen for him to do that, right? To basically say, well... I can't do anything else more. So my, my, myself and my two remaining brothers that are alive, you know, we're just going to go into hiding essentially. Right. Because at right, this point, right. the, the clones now become the Jedi, you know, yeah. and the, and they're now banned. Right. Because this is the whole reason that Pavel team wanted, right. Everything from the grand Republic or the, 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 um, grand Republic era, he wants to lead it. Right. Because that's not what the empire is about. Wants to just like the American government wants to hide all of its, you know, terrible secrets, right? So that's yeah. what he's trying to do. And, and I like that because he's been able to be palp the whole time and he's been, you know, 10 steps ahead of everyone else. And it would made some great, you know, great, um, great writing from what, like I said, credit to the guys in Bad Batch. Those, the few episodes that they've been giving us throughout the um, first three seasons, 
I like that. And that's, again, why I enjoyed Clone Wars so much, because it wasn't just about the, the war part. It was about the yeah. politics. It was about, and again, that's what's making Andor so great to me, is that it has more than just bang, bang, shoot them up. To your point, the, the typical you know trope of band of heroes and all this stuff. And we get all this other great characters involved because it's a big galaxy. That's what we've talked about. Everything revolves around Tatooine and Coruscant. That's it. Yeah, um, yes. But, uh, but anyways. Why so, does everyone want to go back to Jakku? Right. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, um, so anyway, so that, that's the first part. I'm thinking, I, I don't know. I feel like we're kind of tired of clones at this point, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I said, it, it just feels like anything they've done has been eh. Now, could they give us a movie? And I'll be okay, right? Kind of give us a movie, write it off, you know, in an hour and a half, whatever you can do to complete the story. Fine. I, I'm all for it. Now, to Project Necromancer, hey, there's a lot on the table that they can do with this, right? They could, you know, spin it into something of its own series. We could get Asajj, the Ventress series that we talked about. Um, we could get something um, to basically, you know, based off a skeleton crew, right? Or skeleton crew Mm -hmm. after the Empire. I I, I still can't figure out the precise timeline pinpoint for skeleton crew. I think it is post uh, Return of the Jedi. So it is in the Mandalorian era, I think. Um, But it could also still be, uh, there's still some rumors that maybe it's actually after the rise of Skywalker and it's past episode nine. I, I was under the really impression know. it was after under under this premise because they had a force sensitive child they were trying to keep away from the empire. That's what okay. I thought this was supposed to be maybe about. Maybe so. And maybe that's, that's why quite... we, we were talking before this. Maybe they're trying to rewrite it twenty times because of it being screwed up. Um, and yeah. from all you the behind the scenes drama. You could be quite correct drama. about it. So yeah, it could be totally that they're keeping this kid from the empire, and so we're talking galactic civil war kind of thing. Yeah, I don't Anyways. know. But um, but to me that that could connect the dots, right? If if that was at that time period again, or bringing back Project Necromancer. I mean, for all we know, Omega could be the one showing up in this. You know, that, that mm-hmm. she could show up in Skeleton Crew um, as a yeah. teen or an adult, right? Depending on the era, or a grandma if it's past Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, but um, you know, she uh, uh, she starts doing the Benjamin Button thing because she gets to old age and then her clone DNA that was. You know, they thought they turned off the uh, accelerated aging, but really they turned it the dial too far the other way. Because again, even their genetics are analog, um, and they they turned the dial the, too far that way, and she starts reverse aging, and that's mm. the whole story. Whoa! She goes from skeleton okay. to crew, so um... <laughs> <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so I mean, and obviously, I, I'm hoping. Mando doesn't end up in just a movie to be at season four, essentially. I'm hoping, yeah. you know, we'll actually still get a season four and a movie. And season four can connect the dots there. Ahsoka season two could because, again, Thrawn's back, right? Um, obviously, mm-hmm. we expect Moff Gideon not quote unquote dead, but all those resources still went into it, right? Like that stuff would now be under Thrawn if, if the Empire now goes under Heir to the Empire. So yeah. um, we do that, right? So I don't think it's completely over um, with Project Necromancer. If anything's going to continue, to me, that's the theme versus clones. Um, like I said, I could very well see clones kind of just being, um, we'll tackle that in a comic book or a novel, to your point, yeah. Um, yeah. somewhere down the line. And then to see, you know, do we think there's a project in the works to explain those? Possibly. Um, but really, I, I'd like to know, you know, Scott, you know, what would you think could be, something they could be do for the next animation. Like is again, a certain time period that you would like to see them do animation on or anything. I, I want to see an animated series that takes place either in the sequel trilogy era or in the time frame that is um, the high Republic. Uh, so I'd want to see like an animated show in the high Republic era. That isn't Resistance, uh, or that isn't the Young Jedi, because those are the two animations we got. Right, right. Well, re- well Resistance, People... is, Resistance is done, uh, and I guess technically the um, Young Jedi Adventures is High Republic, right? Yes, it's is High right? Republic because Yoda, yeah, yeah. Yoda's in that, but it's pre all you know pre Phantom Menace. So, 
yeah, yeah. Alternately, instead of those two things, if we're gonna start doing almost do a do some legends stories as animation. And so therefore I'd like to see Darth Revan and his story as an animated series. So that would be really cool. Um, the story, of course, made famous in Star Wars The Old Republic RPG games, like on console, and then later you interact with Revan in, uh, so Knights of the Old Republic and Knights of the Old Republic Part Two, um, And then later you get to interact with Revan in Star Wars The Old Republic MMO. Um, and so I would like to see those stories told as an animated uh, s series instead of just as video games. Um, and there was supposed to be this remake of Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, but I think it like never actually got made, right? Or uh, no, they re-released them. Come... They no, they they but... did. It's it's released. Okay. Um, it's All out right, there. Cool. You can buy it on any of the newer game consoles um, out there. So it's basically just kind of, you know, not like uh, I guess you would say just remastered, right? It was essentially okay. cleaned right. up. Um, for the most part, right? It's not like, you know, some of the old games from the 90s, like you try putting them in a computer nowadays, um, you know, and it can't handle it, right? Because it's just going way right. too fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, or it just doesn't work. It doesn't compute, right? So, <laughs> so yeah, they basically, they've been doing that with a lot of classic games, um, updating them um, to whatever, you know, newer format uh, that they can put out there and, and then put a 50 $60 label on it and sell it and yes us idiots gobble it up because like oh <laughs> yeah, i haven't I... played this game in forever and yeah but it's like uh, i guess i could try getting it on steam but if i really want to play it on my console i guess i'm kind of stuck so okay. yeah yeah but, yeah I'm, I'm with you i think i think a i don't want to say mature but but again aim towards story writing like rebels was again feloni and this is what it says that's why bad batch i think is not one of our um, required viewerships, you know, that I've told people, like I've told people, I'm like anything past clone Wars season one and season six, you know, everything else about clone wars is phenomenal. And then rebels, everything about it, you have to watch. Like if you're going to watch animation, you cartoons are for kids. No watch rebels. If you're a star Wars fan, because it is phenomenal. Um, I would, I would love, you know, somebody, um, to you know feloni to work with i guess or just i don't know or again maybe maybe if you did start from scratch in the high republic and just got somebody else not trying to do feloni you know what i'm saying you get the wish right. version um you know <laughs> wish.com dave feloni yeah yeah um you know hey that, wait a minute wish.com dave feloni i think i know that guy it's <laughs> dave feloni yeah. <laughs> uh but uh yeah no i i just think that uh if we got something starting fresh and, and not trying to buy off other things other than some of the, the, the legend stuff or whatever you want to say, you know, or even what they've done with the comics and novels, give us those characters, right? I mean, give us the High Republic, those characters coming to, to real life. I'm fine with that, right? Give them something because not all of us are going to read or, you know, the comics or the novels. So yeah. I think that's where they should really go. Well... Fans, whatever is the next Star Wars animated show, you can guarantee yourself that we're going to talk about it here on What a Piece of Junk. But we're not done with this episode yet. We're going to take a short break, and then Derek and I will come back and talk about going to see Star Wars The Phantom Menace on the big screen on the 25th anniversary of the original release of the movie. And afterwards, at the end of the movie, we got to see a cool sneak peek for some new footage from Star Wars The Acolyte coming out later in June. But for now, Kevin's going to tell us about the other shows here on the Fandom Podcast Network. Thank you for listening. We hope you're enjoying this podcast. Here are the other great shows on the Fandom Podcast Network. Culture Clash, where we discuss the latest in entertainment and pop culture. Blood of Kings, our show covering the entire Highlander universe. Couch Potato Theater, we celebrate our favorite movies. And Time Warp, our fandom flashback show discussing a year in movies and our favorite retro movie, TV, and pop culture topics. Good evening, discussing all things Alfred Hitchcock. Hair Metal Podcast, we cover the rock metal music of the 80s and early 90s. Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast, discussing the time-traveling Doctor Who universe. Lethal Mullet, an action film podcast, covering the 80s, 90s, and beyond. Also, check out the Lethal Mullet Network for more great podcasts. What a Piece of Junk, our Star Wars podcast. Making Treks, a Star Trek podcast, with a deep dive into the final frontier. The Fandom Show. 
our Fandom Podcast Network live YouTube show discussing the hottest topics in fandom. The True Believers MCU Podcast, discussing the Marvel Cinematic and Television Universe. Union Federation, our Star Trek and the Orville show. And we're proud to welcome the BQN Network to the Fandom Podcast Network. Please visit our friends on the BQN Network, a Star Trek Universe podcast that also includes your favorite topics, movies, history, superheroes, and more. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on YouTube. The Fandom Podcast Network is also on all major podcast platforms. The Fandom Podcast Network audio master feed is on Podbean at fpnet.podbean.com. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and remember, respect others and enjoy your fandom. All right, thanks very much, Kevin. Well, Derek uh, got to go see The Phantom Menace on May the 4th, so that was really cool. Uh, I have the uh, unique opportunity of having to say that I've gotten to see The Phantom Menace on opening day each time they did it, except for the 3D pr uh, production of The Phantom Menace. I didn't go see that one on the day that it first released. Um, I did end up seeing that one in theaters, so... Ironically, you know, I wasn't a huge fan of The Phantom Menace in May of 1999. Uh, like all of us, it didn't live up to the hype because that was nearly impossible. That was the most hype of almost anything ever um, to, for Star Wars to be returning to the big screen. Uh, but um, even though I wasn't that big of a fan of it in May of 99, I think it may be the Star Wars film that I've seen in a theater the most times. Because I went to go see it three times in uh, May of 99, or at least in 99, I went to go see it three times. Because uh, I always go to see any Star Wars movie, I go to see it at least three times in the theater. If it's really good, I'm going to go like four or five. Uh, now, I'm not Kevin Reitzel, where I'll go see The Force Awakens more than 20 times in the yeah, theater. like 27, um, 29 or something like that. I, I don't even know at this point. Uh, but, uh, but, but weirdly, I believe I've seen The Phantom Menace seven times in the theater over the course of its, you know, several re-releases. I saw it three times in 99. Uh, I saw it as part of the... Uh, I saw the, the 3D re-release. That's the n number fourth time I saw it. The fifth time I saw it was during the Star Wars movie marathon of episodes one through seven when uh, The Force Awakens released. And, of course, I saw it during the Star Wars movie marathon one through nine when The Rise of Skywalker released. And then just this past weekend on May the 4th for the 25th anniversary. So yes, I've seen it seven times in a cinema and countless times on television, either on TNT or Disney Plus or something like that. Um, and uh, it still holds up. I had a really good time on May the 4th. Mita and Joseph went with me, so we did a family outing. Matthew had to work, unfortunately, but also, fortunately, Matthew was able to get a new job recently, so that's good. Um, and so... Uh, it still holds up. You know, it's, it's, people like to complain a little bit about the story and, and certainly the acting and Jar Jar Binks, famously, people have been complaining about that for decades. Some of those people need to accept the fact that Disney owns Lucasfilm and call up Elsa so that they can learn to let it go. Um, <laughs> and so I enjoyed the movie again, uh, but I can definitely see where it's creaking a little bit in the droid army joints, if you will, in the... Uh, con the department of pacing. The film's pacing compared to contemporary movies is not great. There were a couple of times where I felt like, you know, I gotta make sure I don't doze off because Joseph will never let me live it down if I fell asleep during a Star Wars movie. Um, never mind the fact that... Except if it's Tag of the Clones. Several Star Wars movies <laughs> in the, yes, it's Attack of the Clones, I'll, I'll sleep through that. No, he loves that movie. He thinks Attack of the Clones is the best of the prequels. So anyway, um, but uh, and hey, you know what? It's, it's, it's like Nathan says about pizza. You know, there's there's good pizza and bad pizza, but at the end of the day, it's still pizza. So, you know, there's good Star Wars and bad Star Wars, but at the end of the day, it's still Star Wars. So Attack of the Clones is my least favorite film of all the series, but I still will watch it. You know, Jango Fett's a cool dude. He's so cool. We I mean, him, like, the a last million times. 30 minutes of all that action is pretty sweet. It's mm -hmm. not bad, right? The, the you know, yeah. other than Yoda going Daffy Duck mode to distract you, <laughs> if, he, if he didn't have all the and just did the action <laughs> stuff, like, it'd be okay. Um, other than that, I, the last 30 minutes or so is, is just fun Star Wars stuff to your point. So. Yeah, and I, and I kind of got to that point with uh, The Phantom Menace, this, this most recent uh, viewing of it in theater. Uh, it's that 
yeah, I, I kind of didn't like all the establishing shots of the Padres Arena and the establishing shots of the Gungan home and all that stuff. Um, you could tell that George Lucas was from an era of directors and producers and, and cinematography that the spectacle was the thing because you've got a lot of establishing shots. Contemporary filmmakers and contemporary audiences don't need you to sit there and give them a big pan of the skyline of San Francisco. Just go ahead and show us the Golden Gate Bridge and then start doing stuff. We'll know that you're in San Francisco. Same deal here. You know, George, we don't necessarily need all these desert vistas to show us that we're on Tatooine, right? But then I have to remind myself, in 1999, we all went gonzo for that stuff because, wow, look at all the huge shots of Star Wars planets with crazy aliens actually walking around and really filling the scene with action because they were going nuts for CGI in Hollywood the way they are nowadays almost for artificial intelligence in Hollywood. Um, but, but the overall storyline of the film, A Stranger Comes to Town, in this case, the Jedi Knights come to Naboo, um, just, I mean, it's still a great story. Uh, and then the idea that, uh, you know, Anakin is there as the chosen one. You know, the, the, the fun thing to me about The Phantom Menace is if you don't know a darn thing about Star Wars, you know nothing about Star Wars, and you go watch this movie, you're going to have a good time. Because it's a nice adventure yarn in outer space with a nice dash of science fiction. You know, if you do know a lot about Star Wars and you've somehow never seen The Phantom Menace, it's cool to see all of the things interacting and interlacing with the rest of the plots and the, the galaxy at large. Um, and so there's always something you can watch for. And then, like you said about Attack of the Clones, let me, let's be honest. George Lucas doesn't do everything perfect, but my goodness, does the man know how to do a climax. Whatever the finish of a Star Wars film is, people always talk about, oh, my favorite part is like the last half hour, right? Like, so the Battle of Naboo, really cool, because you also have included as part of that the Duel of the Fates. Good stuff. Probably the best lightsaber duel and one of the best sword duels I've ever seen on film. Uh, Attack of the Clones, ending, action-packed. Revenge of the Sith, it's Anakin versus Obi-Wan's duel. Talk about action-packed and earth-shattering. Um, A New Hope, the end of the movie. The end of the movie is the part that people talk about all the time with the battle at the Death Star, right? That was the part that made people just go, what in the world is this? The world was not ready for that kind of thing in 1977. Uh, and then, of course, Empire Strikes Back. The end is uh, Luke versus Vader with an awesome duel. That's good stuff. And Return of the Jedi, the, the duel on the Death Star 2, plus the battle with the Ewoks on Endor, and then the big space fight outside Death Star 2. I mean, that was like three climaxes all wrapped into one. You know, Return of the Jedi was the king of spectacle for a while. Well, and you had that uh, with the then, Phantom Menace, though, too, don't forget, because mm -hmm. you had them flying above too in the spaceships right with anakin yep. and, and the bravo fighters like you said the duel yeah. and then you had really you actually had four battles because then you had the princess and panaka versus viceroy and yeah. them uh and then you had the gungans versus the battle droids so you really yeah, had four yeah, because, in that one <laughs> yeah the phantom menace takes a bunch of star wars tropes and turns them up to 11 right because yeah. yeah we have a lightsaber duel but we don't have two guys fighting we have three guys fighting and, and so the one on guy's so got forth. a dual lightsaber <laughs> yeah, that's right <laughs> I'd, lo I'd love to, when 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 we got to the part where Darth Maul um, fights Qui Gon in the desert. Uh, Joseph leaned over to me earlier in that part of the movie and was all, "How come Qui Gon Jinn didn't recognize, didn't realize there was a Sith probe droid listening to him and Watto discuss stuff after they settled up their bets on the pod race?" And Qui Gon's like, "I want all this stuff," and Watto's like, oh, "You've ruined me," you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the probe droid goes by in the background and then goes back and reports to Darth Maul. And Joseph leans over, he's like, "Dad, this is so unrealistic. How come Qui Gon didn't realize that was a probe droid?" And I'm like, "Well, son, at this point, do we think that Qui Gon Jinn?" knows what a sith probe droid looks like and he's like oh he doesn't actually really even know what a sith looks like because then when he fights darth maul he's all like what was that and I'm like exactly so you know we we were doing a little hushed hushed anal analysis of the film since everybody there had seen it at least twice probably um and then later um we talked a little bit about uh how when they get to the hangar on Naboo and they the, the doors open and then there's Darth Maul and he's got his lightsaber and Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan are like, oh, it's the guy from uh, Tatooine, so we're going to have to fight him. And then he turns the light, he throws back the hood, turns the lightsaber sideways and ignites the other one. And you almost see this look on Ewan McGregor's face where he wants to look at his master and go, what? He's got two? Can, can he even do that? Is that allowed? <laughs> Why don't we have two? You know. So we had a lot of fun with the movie, of course. 
yeah. but yeah, it's it, 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 that's an iconic scene. It's so iconic that when they started doing the marketing for The Force Awakens all those years later, uh, um, Kylo Ren out in the snow igniting the crossguard saber was like the moment from the trailer, similar to the double saber. You know, they like they almost homaged Darth Maul with uh, with Kylo Ren's lightsaber. Anyway, Derek, what did you think? And then we'll talk a little bit about the Ac- acolyte stuff. Yeah. So um, I remember May was it twenty first, nineteen ninety nine, when that came out, mm-hmm. or was it twenty? Uh, actually, it was May the nineteenth. Was sure it May nineteenth? I'll go check. Okay. So I'll go check um, while you. Whatever it was. Back then, kids, you couldn't go at 6 o'clock on a Thursday. You had to be there at midnight. Um, you couldn't pre-buy your tickets uh, seating arrangements. You actually could pre-buy your tickets two weeks before they were the showing, but you actually had to physically go to the movie theater and do it to pick up your tickets. Um, you couldn't even call in and get them. Uh, and then you had to stand in line and, you know, first come, first serve for seating, basically. So... I remember every Star Wars movie, my dad and I would go opening night. And this is the first time that the hype was there because I got to see the the year before, right? Was when did special edition come out? Was that ninety eight, right? Special edition yeah. came out? Yeah, they did, they did I think it was ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight. No, it was all it was No, it was all in like a it was all summer. All in one year. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was, it was either ninety seven or ninety eight. I thought it was yeah. 98. I thought it was the year before, but it might have been 97. Either way, I, I, I was excited to see that, right? I, I got to see those um, on the big screen because, again, that wasn't something that movie theaters were doing very often where they were showing, quote-unquote, classic films in the 90s, right? Um, occasionally, the, some of them would do, like, the Rocky Horror and stuff, but it cost them too much money to get the rights to, like, come play Star Wars at this point because – yeah. You know, they didn't have the it whole... It was 90, 97 was the special edition. All three okay. of them, 97. So it actually had to be something that the studios wanted to do. Um, unless if, it, like I said, it was some really classic film that, you know, they could get, the theater could get on the cheap to re-show, right? Because the, really the only way theaters were making money back in the day, they actually had to depend on ticket sales for money. Nowadays, they just base it all off concession stands. That's why you pay $20 for a freaking, you know, bucket of popcorn. Um, but, yeah. uh, you know... So I remember that. I remember, you know, I was 15, not even because I would have turned 16 that summer of 99. So I was 15. I remember staying up, right, all night, watch that movie. I mean, it was so much fun because you just had everybody, you know, line out the door of the theater. Luckily, it was good weather um, because you never know with May up in, in northeast Cleveland. It could get rain <laughs> or even possibly snow still. Um, but, uh, yeah, and, uh, just everybody was, you know, there's people, tons of people cosplayed and all that, you know, like I said, the line wrapped around the entire building of the movie theater to get in. Um, you know, my dad and I would conquer up. I would take my ticket, go get the two seats while he stood in line to go get the, the popcorn and the pop and the snacks. Um, and then we watched the movie and then, I mean, Star Wars, you know, is still a two and a half hour movie. So even if you did start at midnight, um, and you're done. You still weren't getting home till 3 a.m. I had school the next day because that technically was Friday morning, <laughs> Thursday night, Friday morning. Um, and so, <laughs> so I remember talking, you know, a couple of my friends. I mean, we talked about it, right? Like, oh, my God, you know, blah, 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 blah. A couple of the other friends were like, well, don't spoil everything. I got to see it still. So um, and then I saw it three times in the theater. Um, I was 15. Um, I was obviously a diehard Star Wars fan, but I wasn't enough to the point where it was like, oh, Jar Jar Binks ruined everything. I didn't really start to dislike Jar Jar probably till a couple years later um, when I just, yeah. you know, yeah, was rewatching was it. Um, you know, he was he was just a fun character, right? Because really you didn't have the you had a little bit of the comedy from C-3PO and R2-D2, but not a whole lot like you would do with the other movies. Right. Um, so he was just the comedic relief. Right. Um, so anyway, so, you know, watching that, and like I said, talking about it, it was just something I always liked. And yeah, later on, I, you know, prequels, I didn't necessarily hate them. I just like, yeah, they're, you know, especially after attack of the clones, I'll be honest, you know, I watched attack of the clones once in theater and revenge of the Sith once in theater. Um, and I never really bothered rewatching them. I, I haven't had a chance to always do it. Um, where it's like, oh, you know, now the original trilogy, if I can get a chance, right, I'll, I'll go watch those. And then obviously I've seen every Star Wars movie that's come out um, at the theater then. But uh, 
watching it this past year, you know, yesterday, uh, this, this, this past weekend, I was going to say, but this yesterday, um, I have to say, I, I, it was quite fun. Um, yeah. As most of the Space Junkie listeners know, I'm not the biggest fan on the sequel trilogy. Um, but the prequel trilogy, I, you know, it still feels like Lucas. It still feels like that Star Wars magic. To your point, there's the moments of just quietness, essentially, of panning. You got John Williams music playing. Um, I, I, it, the CGI, yes, it's corny, especially nowadays. I still make fun yeah. of Babylon 5. It's not that bad. Um, it's not bad. It's corny. <laughs> it's corny. Cheesy CGI. Not bad CGI. Um, but I will tell you, and I, I mentioned in the chat, that pod race, that holds up mm-hmm. very well in the theater. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Um, that 15, 20 minutes of that, like you got the, you know, the, the surround sound, the roaring of the engines, all that stuff. Um, I don't know if you noticed or not remembered that Disney's done this in the past few years, that they got rid of gray young Yoda and put in green old Yoda. Yes. Um, so yes. they did use the updated. I believe, actually, I believe George did that. Uh, he re- when they did the, uh, for, for the 3D, I think it was oh, when he... They? updated him for the i'll have to look that up while you continue i always thought that was just um, something disney did later um I in the think, past i think Yoda getting changed so. happened before the sale to disney but but let me look maybe while you continue maybe talking. but uh anyways no it was it was just like oh okay so they're actually using the updated footage here um so not as distracting because that was one of the things i remember that was just the one thing i really disliked when <laughs> when you got uh when i watched it as a kid right um as a teenager and it's just like ah So, um, but yeah, no, it was, it was fun. Um, to your point, right. It's, it's, uh, you know, obviously other than a little bit of creepiness between Anakin and Padme, um, outside of that, everything's pretty good. Um, the ending is, you know, still that, that duel of the fates is phenomenal. That still gets, you know, cheers. Every time the Darth Maul does that, I always think of the, um, the one TikTok or YouTube video where they do, and they have the whole UFC of Joe Rogan and uh, 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 D- uh, Cormier, Daniel Cormier, when they all do it, went from the knockout, um, and they just show the you know every reaction as a kid when he went to the second lightsaber, and then the bottom portion section has them where they all shows the camera view of them doing the announcing, and then when the uh, UFC fighter gets knocked out, they go oh, <laughs> and all the audience just stands up and everybody's cheering and all that stuff from the knockout. Yeah. Uh, but you know, that's all Star Wars kids, you know, fans reacted when they got the dual, dual lightsaber there. Um, but yeah, no, that was just, it was fun. Um, it, 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 you know, obviously I really wish, you know, Sophia would want to go. It's not the point where she's at the age yet. I mean, she's four going on five. I'll be honest, yeah. even as an old person, I'm not that old, but I mean, come on, I'm 40 going on 41. <laughs> You're a little bit older than me, Scott. I've listened to I a am. lot talk, of, which I'll talk talk about in just a second here but i've listened to a lot of heavy metal rock concerts i'm half deaf probably at this point i I blared my music in the car way too many times but i've tried to be a bit more respectful as i've gotten older especially with my daughter because she's i don't want to say she's sensitive to sound but she doesn't like loud noises right she just doesn't you know obviously fire trucks or you know fireworks and all stuff she doesn't mind them you know if she's um got her headphones on but that's the only time she ever does anything like it's just you know just she's like i said she doesn't like super loud bang noises right which i can respect but i know the theater she would have a hard time just because i mean for whatever reason they sit there and still have to blare people i'm just like holy cow like if it's the theater's like literally full with 150 200 people i can be okay with that but it's like there's like 20 of us in the theater yeah yeah, yeah, (laughs) you can you can pull it back a little bit i don't need that sound you know where i'm like okay um but uh not to sound old on it but like i said other than that i mean i I had a lot of fun it you know like i said i i i felt good because like i said my, my dad's been passed away since 2011 so you know 13 you know 13 years this august it would have been great yeah. to go to the theater again with him on this stuff because it would have been something we did 25 years ago. Um, so it was just a yeah. lot of fun. Um, you know, I, I, I left it smiling. I, I felt good. I was like, hey, that was that was a lot of fun. And I, I enjoyed it. It was the 25th anniversary. I got to enjoy it on Star Wars Day. 
and it just tickled me pink. So I, I can't say anything other than, I mean, you know, hope, hopefully many of our listeners got to do the same thing. I know Kevin posted some stuff, even though he's in Australia, he did like the three, um, three movie original trilogy for it. And then I think he was doing the Phantom Menace either later that day or something afterwards some for himself. So, um, you know, hopefully all, like I said, all of our listeners got to do a little bit of experience either yesterday or today. I don't know if it's running, for, I think, for a week or two weeks. I think, I think they said they were bringing it weeks. back. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so hopefully I'm a couple of my friends didn't, you know, unfortunately one had his um, his nephew was graduating from college and he decided to have his freaking graduation party on, you know, Star Wars Day. I'm like, <laughs> I told him, I said, unless if it's themed Star Wars graduation party, I said, you should yeah. disown him because he could have waited. Right. He's got the whole summer. Um, to throw yep. a graduation party, but anyways, so so yeah, I looked it up. Um, Yoda was replaced in the Phantom Menace in 2011 for a it, it, so that wasn't even for the 3D thing. It was just the re-release, um, and it was part of George Lucas making updates to both trilogies because that's also the same year, 2011, that Lucas did the special version of Return of the Jedi where Hayden Christensen appears as a Force ghost for Anakin Skywalker at the mm. end of Return of the Jedi, um, which a lot of people remember because that was a very controversial move to replace Sebastian Shaw. Um, but uh, more to the point, um, the official release date for The Phantom Menace was May the 19th of 1999, okay. And I remember vividly because that is my birthday. So that was oh, when I turned yeah. 22 on that day. And uh, don't worry what I'm about to say. It's going to sound like I'm going to get myself in trouble, but that's okay. Both of the women involved understand this and they're okay with it. That was my first marriage as well uh, during my honeymoon. So I had been married to the mother of Matthew and Joseph. Uh, she wasn't their mother yet. Um, for about three days or so, uh, and we were on our honeymoon in Walt Disney World. We had pre-bought the tickets because you could actually pull that off at Downtown Disney. So our travel agent included the tickets for the new Star Wars movie as part of the package to Disney World. So uh, May the 19th of 1999 is still my best birthday ever, and it's going to be really hard for anything ever to change that because I woke up that morning on my honeymoon draw your own conclusions. Then <laughs> my wife and I went to swim with the dolphins at Living Seas at Epcot Center, spent the day at the Disney World Parks, and that night we ate an incredible meal in Disney on campus at one of the restaurants and went to go see an opening day Star Wars film at Downtown Disney, surrounded by people wearing actual Lucasfilm Disney costumes. And the movie was great. Like you said, we didn't all get on the Jar Jar hate bandwagon until much later. Um, and she always likes, my ex-wife always likes to rag on me about how I was actually quite a Jar Jar fan the night of the movie. And I'm just like, Sally, I was on cloud nine. There's nothing could go wrong in my life that day, you know? And so it's still the greatest birthday I've ever had because I did do all those things all in one day. Um, I mean, that's insane, right? And one so question I still talk was, about it. one question, all that other stuff on combined. Was Matthew conceived? <laughs> no, no, it doesn't he didn't line up. Show okay. up and, he doesn't. He, no, it didn't line up because he didn't show up until. Uh, hmm, actually, wait a minute. All right, I'm gonna think about this later. No, Matthew was born in the year 2000, so no, he uh, oh. and he was born in December of the oh, year okay, 2000. Okay, okay, never. Mind. So no, he doesn't line up uh, because he always loves the fact that he was born in the year 2000 because he likes to tell people that he is a millennium baby. He's like, I'm a millennial by virtue of being, you know, arriving at, in the New Year's Eve of the millennium. Uh, and also, he he's like, it's super easy for people to remember how old I am because look at what year is on the calendar and subtract one. He's like, this is 24, so I'm 23. This is 25, so I'm 24, and so on and so forth. He thinks that's cool, because uh, he's a bit of a numbers geek. And I'm like, well, you're right, son, and it's always going to be that way, because I really don't expect you to live much past 100, so it's like, it's 2100, so Matthew is 99 years old, you know, <laughs> et cetera. Uh, but yes, May the 19th, 1999, release date for Star Wars The Phantom Menace and landmark day in my life for a variety of reasons. Uh, and, and really great movie. So uh, I'm always happy to tell people about that story. Um, I don't know, maybe someday, my, like maybe when I turn 50, uh, Lucasfilm will finally get their act together and start releasing Star Wars movies in May again because most of the Star Wars movies that were really good and highly successful came out in May, not this December nonsense. Come on, you guys. We had one, anyway. one movie, right? That was just Solo, right? It was, 
yes, that one turned out. So I enjoyed Solo. No, I love Solo. To I, I, just, I was actually watching it before we we aired. I'm still watching it. But yeah, I'm not right now. Already. But monetarily, it it was the it's the one May release of Star Wars that didn't do so well monetarily. So yeah, so. Yeah, they're all stuck on this December release date. Though, I think that they said that one of the new Star Wars movies would be aimed in May. I thought that they were talking about the big hype. Again, I'll believe it when we actually get a freaking trailer and we can actually say, hey, it's coming out in like five months. But Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And speaking of trailers, after The Phantom Menace yesterday, because we're recording this on May 5th, uh, we got to see a cool extended look, sneak peek, what have you, trailer for Star Wars The Acolyte. Uh, Derek, I thought it was great. Uh, I loved the uh, the duel, basically, that happened between Master Indara and... Uh, I'm going to drive myself crazy not being able to remember these characters. My, yet, my, but, uh, me, my, Mia? Mia, Maya. Mia. Um, she showed up in this yeah. um, cantina, some backwater planet, uh, goes strides across the room. Uh, you guys can find this on YouTube, so if you want to watch it, um, you can you can follow along. You turns out you didn't have to go see the Phantom Menace to be Which able to see this trailer. Which thoroughly pissed me off. They couldn't wait. Yeah, like, yeah. I would have liked to. <laughs> I would have loved for that to have been an exclusive, so that you have to go to a movie to watch yeah. the trailer because it would be it would be a nice you know callback to the fact that we all went to go see Meet Joe Black in 1998 to watch the Star Wars The Phantom Menace trailer in front of a movie because you couldn't really find it anywhere else right yeah. anyway so if they if they had put an exclusive trailer in front of The Phantom Menace that would have been hilarious which to uh, be no. fair to be fair all it really was was just an extended fight scene that you've already seen because yeah. everything else in the trailer was already released in the first trailer where it shows, to your point, Mia walking up into the cantina, and then there's, you know... Um, uh, uh, Master Indara. Master Indara, um, you know, and the whole yeah, fight. Carrie Moss. Yeah, yeah. Carrie Moss, and you see a couple of... There are even actual fight scenes, right? And we're like, oh, this is a mm -hmm. homage to Crouching Tiger, Hidden, uh, Cr Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Um, yeah, you got you it. You know, homage. And it was just like, okay, so... Like, we got that, and I was like, okay, like, we're going to get, like, more than a couple of minutes, which we really didn't. Um, no. But uh, overall, it was just basically after that, the same as the rest of the trailer. It was really just filling yeah. in a couple of the extra, you know, a minute or so worth of the fight scene, which was cool. Don't get me wrong. It was cool. I enjoyed I, the, I'm hyped I, about the I'm show. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that um, – I can't remember if this was in the trailer already, but – after um, Mia has been punching, uh, beating up some of these other people that are just for some reason hanging around the table where Master Indara is sitting, and the guy, the alien dude with the white hair, goes to shoot her. He can't get his gun out of the holster because his gun's jammed in the holster. I thought that was pretty hilarious, actually. Yes. Uh, and then when he finally gets it out, she's had enough time to turn over the table so that he does a classic Western salute. I think fight it was uh, some type cover, of gambling take table cover behind too. The, yeah, like Pazak or something. It yeah. wasn't Sabak. I think it's Pazak mm. or something like that. Yeah, because you know this is set uh, before the Phantom Menace, so I believe we don't. Sabak hasn't really taken the galaxy by storm yet. I believe Pazak is the name of the uh, the game that people play for the most part. I mean, or one of the other games that we said because they gotta have millions of gambling games. I mean, why would you only have one yes. or two games ever in the galaxy? Yeah. I mean, they even have slot machines, you know. So. Yeah. Slot machines that look like BB-8. Mm-hmm. So, but <laughs> but uh, no, it was, uh, but, it was fun, but I was going to text all my friends, but then I just realized, oh, you guys are going to see the movie anyways. It's going to be like, you don't really need to stay for the trailer, but then I was kind of like, eh, I'll let them have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it, it was the most recent update to The Phantom Menace. Now it has an after credit scene. <laughs> well, and to be fair, I don't know if it was just me, but the end credits, did they, like, fast-forward that? Because that went by quick. I don't know. I was honestly looking at my phone up until the part where the credit for Jabba oh. the, the Hutt went by. Like, because I, I, uh, Jabba the, I, yeah. I loved the fact that in, in The Phantom Menace, uh, I don't know, many people might not know this, but if you ever watch the credits for The Phantom Menace, when it goes to the cast list, it says Jabba the Hutt as himself. <laughs> well, oh, and, and then also... I noticed the um, which this has been there for a while because Joseph reminded me that we heard it at the marathon. But at the very end, mm -hmm. after the Teamsters logo and all goes by, you can hear Vader's breathing. Yes, yes, you hear that. The coach, coach. Yeah. So. Oh, burr. Oh, burr. 
I was like, hey, it's Vader's breathing. He, and Joseph's like, yeah, Dad, we, we talked about this back when we were in Atlanta. And I'm like, son, that was 2015. you got to give me a break. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, uh, like yeah, I so said, I'm, I'm, I'm hyped about the Acolyte. Yeah, so... Yeah, but like I said, it was uh, it was just a fun day. I mean, like I said, it was it been a while, you know, to the fact that uh, being able to see a Star Wars movie because you know that's one of the things that we've griped about for a while now that uh, you know we haven't had anything since um, you know 2019. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. Everything else, um, obviously, they've had a couple of the um, series episodes that uh, went on big screen um, for some mm -hmm. stuff. They did a couple of. Um, uh, opportunities at select theaters, which are like ten cities in the entire freaking you know United States. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. If you don't um, live in Mega City One or Mega City Two, you're not going to get to see those yeah. few releases. And so. to be honest, I don't want to live in any of those mega cities, so I'm good. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, give, but give like, me the irradiated wasteland any day of the week. <laughs> but I look at it too. It's just like most of the stuff you can watch all the because. Like I said, apparently some a lot of these Star Wars movies, like I said, they come out almost every year or two. They're doing some type of, um, you know, phantom event or, you know, something at the um, theater to bring back, um, you know, pre people in because a lot of people just want to see classic movies, you know, um, so they can, you know, if most of the studios probably nowadays, like I said, it's almost kind of probably like a rental DVD to some, um, I would imagine some point where they just spread these DVDs around and they just go from theater to theater and, you know, they get them to rent out. They use them for the weekend um, or they it seems like a Sunday and a Wednesday or something like that is the randomness mm -hmm. that the, the movie tavern here does um, for classic, classic uh, movies. Um, and then, so you'll get that and then boom, you know, then next week they'll have another movie of some sort and it's another classic movie. And then it feels like, Oh, and then like maybe a year or two later, it'll come back again and be like, Oh, I missed it last time or I got to see it, you know, this time I could skip this, you know, skip it this time. So, um, right. So, you know, but, uh, all right, well, it's time for Derek's favorite part of our show. And that is of course, what star Wars t-shirts are we wearing this week? So in keeping with star Wars day and the Phantom Menace, uh, extravaganza i'm wearing my star wars celebration chicago shirt from also back in 2019 but uh april of 2019 where it shows characters from all across the saga including ones from the phantom menace up and down the left side and right side of the shirt in blue for the light side crew and in red for the dark side crew um this is one of my favorite star wars shirts because like i said it's got people from all across the saga big characters minor characters um, and, and it has the classic artwork of Luke's hands holding the hilt of the lightsaber, uh, presumably above his head from the original Star Wars movie poster that was in reference to Flash Gordon. Um, like that, with his, both hands on the hilt, and the blade is stretching out above him uh, to show not only is he holding the weapon of a Jedi Knight, but it is a glow, literal glowing beacon that is the call to action for heroism. It's like the symbol of the hero's journey right there, all in one piece. Uh, and so that blade cuts down the center of the shirt to have one half as light side, one half as dark side. Um, and uh, it's a really cool design, and it's the only shirt I have with any Phantom Menace characters on it. So there you go. Derek, what are you what are you doing this week? Are we doing a shirt, or you got some more merch? No, I got I got my shirts. I, I told you guys I would actually have some new stuff to do, because um, I Turtle T had a, a bunch of clearance and Star Wars stuff. So I was like, yeah, eight bucks a shirt, I'll take it. Um, so, oh heck yeah, yeah. So I couldn't pass up. So I, I spent like a hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> if you, it was eight bucks a shirt, and you spent a hundred bucks. What is that? After like, well, you had to shirts? pay taxes and you had to pay shipping, so it was like yeah. ten bucks a shirt. Ten bucks a shirt. So. Okay. I got 10 so shirts. Like 10 shirts almost. Yeah. yeah. 10 shirts for 100 bucks. So can't go wrong with that. Um, but anyway, so I was debating whether I wanted to wear my, my Bad Batch one. Because, I mean, even though we ragged a little bit on this episode, I still like the characters, to your point. I like the, yeah. the stuff overall. Um, just like I said, the last couple of seasons could have been executed better. But uh, I could have worn my Bad Batch shirt, but I didn't. I decided to wear one of the new ones because in celebration of the Phantom Menace in 25 years. Ah, oh, it's the Bunta Eve classic pod race. Now this is pod racing. Good times. And it's got Anakin and Sabulba. Sabulba! Uh, as they are facing down against each other on the track there. Yeah. So, 
Oh, uh, Pudu. Yeah, uh, Sebulba. It's a great. He's a great character. I wish they had done more with him in further episodes of the prequels. But what are you yeah. gonna do? Or even the Clone Wars would have been nice to have something an episode yeah. of pod racing. And because apparently, I, I mean, like all the canon, non-canon comics and novels, like he still goes on to be a big time racer. Um, I mm-hmm. love how they, you know, they do pay homage to several of those different racers. <laughs> Yeah. They, they yes. missed it all eight off, like you said. Well, the intro to the pod racing is quite long because um, they yeah. go through like yeah. literally every and they racer. Do, like it really, they matters. do all that, and then they have the scene where three PO yeah. and all the other people are like walking with across flag. with the flag for each <laughs> racer, and I'm just like, "Come on, George, we get it. This is a grand spectacle." Anyway, I was I reminded of it that. all, though. I appreciate that. But see, we, you were talking about Star Wars Visions earlier when we were mentioning Star Wars animation projects. Season one of Star Wars Visions, of course, had the the rock band group Tatooine that Rhapsody, was basically yeah. Tatooine Rhapsody doing that stuff at the Pod Race Arena. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah. I actually thought about the band when they showed the Pod Race yesterday at the yeah. movie theater. So I'm like, wow. That would have been great if they would have put like, a song in there at some point just to over. over that would have been amazing. But I was more impressed with the quality of Star Wars Visions is such that now – after 25 years, when I look at the Phantom Menace and I see that scene, I think about that little cartoon. And I'm like, Good that was job, one of your guys' guys really least favorites. I, I liked Tatooine Rhapsody. Oh, uh, Nathan you... was the one who was all kind of like, oh. me. I yeah, he to was me, okay with it. Yeah, I mean, he didn't hate it, but it was his, one of his least favorites, he said. Because I think, I can't remember, I think that's like my third favorite out of all of them. Because you would have had the Ninth Jedi, then the Ronin, mm-hmm. and then I had Tatooine Rhapsody. But that's also because I'm a huge Cowboy Bebop fan. And that, to yes. me, was what the homage to that was. Um, so I, I like the Tatooine Rhapsody episode quite a bit. So, yeah. All right. Now I so. enjoy. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so if you guys want to get your own cool "What a Piece of Junk" T-shirt or mouse pad or coffee mug, one of these days I'm going to have to pick like a different group of merchandise things to mention in this segment. Mouse the pads, keychains. They still key make chains. masks for anyone that wants to wear a mask. I mean, for maybe our, if we Throw have any pillow. listeners over in Asia, I know they still wear masks. Yeah, so. <laughs> I think I think you can get a what a piece of junk throw pillow from T Public. Anyway, please head over to tpublic.com and look for Fandom Podcast Network in the user box, and you can find all sorts of stuff for our show and all those other shows that are here on the network. Uh, so, Derek, speaking of the Phantom Pod, Fandom Podcast Network, the Phantom Podcast Network, uh, please uh, tell people where they can find us out there on the internet. So, the big Phantom Podcast Network is on the Podbean app, which is the fpnet.podbean.com, the master feed. You can also find us on really any platform for podcasting and streaming, which would be Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play. Uh, I run the Facebook page, so what a piece of junk! exclamation point a star wars podcast um you can find us but obviously you can look for <laughs> myself or scott um on the internet or even nathan um on facebook and then you'll find us uh scott runs the email which is what a piece of junk pod at gmail.com uh twitter which kyle still kind of oversees a little bit is that what wars and then the instagram page which he also does which is the fandom podcast network and then anytime you you know download us stream us whatever Please leave a review. The five-star reviews are what really help us um, to make sure we're still bringing you this great, wonderful content. Again, hopefully we're entertaining. Uh, we know we have at least 100-plus <laughs> people that listen to us on a weekly basis <laughs> yes. when we drop this. Yes. So that's pretty nice that there's at least 100 people that still have stuck through with us all these years. Um, because as crazy as it sounds, you know, this October, November, we'll hit five years um, for this. Yeah. So. Um, we technically but, uh, started doing this before the pandemic. I know everybody thinks that podcasts really blew up like crazy during the pandemic, and they did, but not this one, baby. <laughs> no, we did it because the launch of Disney Plus and The Mandalorian. Mm-hmm. So, um, yep. and uh, yeah, and technically it was the rise of Skywalker was coming to an end as well. So for the, the mm-hmm. original Skywalker trilogy, um, but uh, the uh, overall, uh, again, please leave us reviews because again, it helps. Anyone that, uh, you know, wants to search for podcasts on Star Wars, the more reviews, um, the more times people type in our <clears throat> our um, title for What a Piece of Junk, the more times it's going to get uh, crazy a logarithm and showing up there. Um, so, again, more reviews, the better, please. 
Yeah. Oh, I really blew the opportunity there when I was talking about podcasts in the pandemic. So here we go. Take two. Podcasting really blew up in the pandistic, but pandemic, but not this ship, sister. There you go. Uh, or not this pod right. racer. That not this racer. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, thanks very much for joining us again, guys, and uh, stick with us next time, where we're gonna come back uh, a little bit later on in June and start reviewing ye old Star Wars: The Acolyte. Uh, so we're excited about that. Uh, and yes, also, Derek, we, we're going to do well, something gonna, about Tales We record next Empire. week, though, for Tales of the Empire. Yes, we're going to do Tales of the Empire for next week. And then yeah. we'll take a little bit of a break until after the Acolyte Part 1. I'll give us about three weeks. Um, <laughs> yes, that'll give us about three weeks, possibly. I don't know. You know but something will happen and we'll be like, guys, we got to report the podcast because of something occurring in Star Wars. You know, There'll, there'll be some sneak peek trailer for um, whatever Daisy Ridley's new movie is in Star Wars. And, and Derek That's will not be coming like, out until oh like 2027 or 2028, I thought. Yeah. Who knows? So, anyways, Who knows? maybe Skeleton yeah. Crew. Maybe Skeleton Crew. Maybe Skeleton Crew. Now, see, that's much more likely than a Daisy Ridley tra uh, teaser trailer because supposedly, like you said earlier in this episode of our show, the the Skeleton Crew is done and they're furiously and post production for like everything. Uh, multiple, mul almost a year now. I feel like at this point, and they've done reshoots yeah. um, late last year. So who knows? And then yeah. Andor yeah. season well, two is wrapping up filming, so they wrapped yes. that up. So we should hopefully get that. Maybe by Christmas time this year, like we did last time. Yeah, I hope so. And we'll talk about it, and you guys can hear it on the show. So we'll talk to you next time. And uh, Nathan's not here to punch it, so I'll just quote Han and be all, Chewie, get us out of here! <laughs>